post-op fever, probably one of the most important topics in perioperative education and perioperative management. Today we're gonna break down post-op fever. I'm gonna talk about causes. I'm gonna talk about timing. You're gonna know it all. All right, let's do it. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name's Dr. Eric Pearson, I'm a pediatric surgeon, and I'm here to help you get more comfortable on the wards, on your exams, in the ICU, and of course, the operating room. And today, we're talking about post-operative fever. Now, in the previous video, we talked about fever, we broke that down, we talked about how it was different than hyperthermia, we talked about the body's set point, we talked about prostaglandin E2, so if you haven't checked out that video, go do it right now. But today I'm gonna to be talking about post-op fever. If you stick around to the end, I'm gonna give you the nine W's. You may have learned the five W's, but today I'm gonna to give you the nine W's of post-operative fever. All right, so let's get into this. Number four. What does the number four have to do with anything? Well, four, there are four phases of post-operative fever. You have immediate post-operative fever. That's within hours of surgery. You have early post-operative fever. That's within days zero to three. You have late post-operative fever. That's when we're gonna be worried about a lot of infections. And that's days four to 30. And then of course, you have delayed post-operative fever. And today we're gonna to get into each of these. So first let's talk about immediate post-operative fever. So this is within hours of operation. Typically this is not a nosocomial infection, typically this is not an infection at all. Usually this is just surgical inflammation and the body's response to surgery. So as we've learned, inflammation releases cytokines. And those cytokines responsible for fever, as we just learned in the last video, are TNF-alpha, IL-1, IL-6. These are all cytokines that you find in the acute phase response. And these cytokines go to the brain, increase our set point, and can cause us to have fever in that immediate post-operative period. The mean time to seeing this increase in temperature rise is about 11 hours. So you wanna ask yourself, is this common? Yes, this is common. Greater than 50% of patients are gonna have an elevated temperature over 100.4 in those first 24 hours after major surgery. So this is why I don't recommend doing a full laboratory workup or culture workup for patients in that first 24 hours who have an elevated temperature because usually, usually, it's due to surgical inflammation. Now it's still important to take your history because your history in a patient with immediate post-operative fever is gonna lead you to the diagnosis. Another cause of immediate post-operative fever are immune-mediated fevers. So these can be drug reactions, and I'm gonna give you a long list of drugs here. Look at all these drugs. So you have antibiotics and non-antibiotics, common and rare drugs, that can cause fever on their own, all right? So fever can be due to drugs. You can also have transfusion-mediated reactions, where you have fevers associated if you had to give any blood products. All right, what's a third cause? So a third cause, this one, this is really scary. And this is malignant hyperthermia. Now we talked about it a little bit in that first video on fever, but malignant hyperthermia is an inherited condition. This is autosomal dominant. And this is where you have a defect in those reanidine receptors on the sarcoplasmic reticulum within muscle cells. And when that happens, you get an abnormal, you get an excessive increase in calcium, which leads to massive skeletal muscle contraction. And that leads to massive heat production, as well as a rise in your potassium. When this happens, you call a cold thermal, you start treating immediately, you treat with things like dantrolene, you treat with things that will lower the potassium, you do potty cooling, and this is all protocolized, but it's important that you're aware of it because the mortality is high, 30 to 50%. So if you ever see this, or when you're taking your history, you have a patient that has a family member with a history of malignant hyperthermia, it's important that you do a protocolized approach and you avoid these triggering agents in these patients. All right, so what's the next immediate post-operative fever? Well, the next one you can get by doing a good history, and that's a patient that has a pre-existing infection. 
So that pre-existing infection, that could be sepsis due to a perforated viscous. That could be a upper respiratory tract infection. That could be a dental infection or a urinary tract infection. And it can also be a skin or soft tissue infection. Patients with these pre-existing infections have a much higher risk of getting a surgical site infection postoperatively. So it's really important that you take that history in the preoperative area and you either acknowledge the risk or cancel the operation. So let's move on to early infections. So early infections, this is not so much within hours, but from postoperative day zero to postoperative day three. And in the early postoperative period, nosocomial infections or hospital acquired infections are very uncommon. But let's talk about the common causes of postoperative fever in this early area. So number one is just continued inflammation. If you have a patient that's been septic and you operated on for perforated viscous and you solve that problem, they may have ongoing inflammation that's gonna to lead to continued fevers. If you have a patient that has a trauma or if you have a patient from a burn, they're gonna have ongoing inflammation and that's gonna cause elevated temperature in this early phase. The fevers here can also be immune mediated. We talked about drugs and transfusion reactions, stress mediated, or it can be from a previous infection as we just talked about. In the early postoperative phase, we will see urinary tract infections. And so this is common in patients who have had previously indwelling urinary catheters, or if it's been a genital urinary operation. Urinary tract infection, if somebody has a fever, is one thing you might want to rule out in that early postoperative period. So early surgical site infection is really important to remember, and I want you to read more about this, because this is something that is rare, but you could catch it and you could save a life because early surgical site infection, which leads to necrotizing fasciitis, has an incredibly high mortality. While surgical site infections are most common after day five, in early surgical site infections, there are two bacteria that are most common. One is Streptococcus, and two is Clostridium perfringens. And these will lead to necrotizing fasciitis, and this is a wildfire in surgery. If you're concerned about an early surgical site infection, you have redness, swelling, tissue that's turning gray or purple, might have crepitus or bulla forming on the skin. It proceeds extremely rapid. I've watched these infections kind of grow before my eyes. That is a wildfire in surgery and needs immediate surgical debridement and antibiotic therapy. Another infection common in this early postoperative period, day zero to three, is pneumonia. It has a peak incidence on day two, and it's increased in ventilated patients. Now, ventilator-associated pneumonia, the risk of pneumonia increases with the duration of mechanical ventilation. So pneumonia, peak incidence on day two, this is common in that first week postoperatively. Also, be aware of pneumonia in that patient that may have an aspiration event in the perioperative area. And another thing is about nasogastric tubes. So patients that have nasogastric tubes, you're stenting open that lower esophageal sphincter and they have an increased risk of aspiration and an increased risk of pneumonia. So now there are some other non-infectious causes of fever in that early postoperative period that are important to talk about. And these are pancreatitis, acute gout, venous thromboembolism, also is alcohol withdrawal, and thyrotoxicosis. So the first one to talk about would be the most common, and this is surgical site infections. Now I did a whole video on surgical site infections, so I want you to check that out, but you can have superficial, deep, or organ space infections. These are most common after post-stop day four, so day five and above, and they can lead to significant morbidity and even mortality. So this is one you wanna be aware of. Every day you wanna be checking your patient's wound and see if they have a surgical site infection, and especially if they have a fever. There are surgery specific causes of fever. So maybe you did a low anterior resection and you have a patient that might have an anastomotic leak. Maybe you have a trocar injury. That can happen with placement of a trocar in the belly. If you have an adhesed piece of bowel to that anterior abdominal wall, you can have a small intestinal injury from placing a trocar. Other causes might be abscesses, depending on the operative environment in which you are conducting 
your operation. Maybe you were already working in a patient that had a perforated viscous or had a big pelvic abscess. Or in children, I have patients with perforated appendicitis and they have purulent fluid all over their abdomen. Now I do my best to wash that and clean it out, but I know that I'm working in a dirty environment and that the risk of a surgical site infection or a, a deep space infection like an abscess is very common. And like we talked about, there are some other infections to be worried about. So we know that the risk of infection is higher if you are cared for in the ICU, and it's important to consider device-related infections. So is there a central venous catheter? Is there an indwelling urinary catheter? Is there a shunt or a drain or a chest tube? These are all routes of possible bacterial invasion. Other infections are a little bit off the radar would be something like a calculus cholecystitis or sinusitis. We've talked about urinary tract infection. And then of course, Clostridium difficile colitis is something in a patient that's had ongoing antibiotics. You've wiped out the microbiome. Clostridium difficile is now overpopulated the colon leading to fever and colitis. So there are also non-infectious causes of fever. We've talked about febrile drug reactions, but it's also really important to consider venous thromboembolism. That's really important to rule out so you don't get a pulmonary embolism, and of course, gout. So let's talk about delayed fever. So this is after 30 days. So in delayed fever after 30 days, this is usually not related to the surgery. Unless, and there are exceptions, if you've had an implanted device, for example, maybe you did a hernia surgery and you have mesh that you put in. Maybe you're an orthopedic surgeon and you put in a prosthesis. These can get infected and lead to delayed fevers after 30 days. All right, so you stuck around this far. I promised I would teach you the nine W's. So the nine W's, these are nine questions you can ask yourself in order to evaluate fever in that postoperative patient. So you've got wind, so looking for pneumonias. You have water, so that is urine, so looking for UTI. We have wound, that's probably one of the most important ones. You gotta check that wound every day. Walking, so venous thromboembolism. Make sure in that early and late period that you don't have a fever resulting from a VTE that can lead to a pulmonary embolism and that has substantial mortality. Wonder drugs, we talked a lot about drug fevers and I gave you a list of common and rare antibiotic and non-antibiotic drugs that can cause fever. How about waves? So you can have cardiac causes and so waves has to do with the EHCG tracing. You have cardiac causes, bacterial endocarditis causes a fever. You can have wonky glands. Now I, I might be stretching just a little bit with these, but you can have fevers from your adrenal glands, fevers from your pancreas for pancreatitis. Withdrawal, we talked about that in both the early and the late phase where you can have alcohol withdrawal leading to a fever. And lastly, possibly the most important W is what did we do to the patient? Did we do an anastomosis that could leak? Did we evacuate a abscess from the pelvis? Did we take down enterocutaneous or entero enterofistulae? Did we do something that could cause us to have a postoperative infection that we need to be worried about? So I hope you enjoyed that talk today on postoperative fever. Super important topic if you're involved in taking care of surgical patients. So if you liked it, share it with your friend, leave a comment below, go ahead, hit the like button. If you haven't had a chance to subscribe, subscribe, turn on the notifications. I love engaging with you guys, so leave me a comment. What topics do you wanna learn in surgery? Also check out citizensurgeon.com. As always, be safe, study hard. I'll see you next time.